it was a very long four years and I never, never thought that I would get better. The doctors were telling me they didn't know um, how much longer I would be around and I could genuinely feel that in my own body. Melissa. Hello, darling. Yay! Oh, how pretty. If it wasn't for meditation, I may not be alive. Meditation saved my life. I'm on my way to Hickory, North Carolina to meet with a girl named Melissa that reached out to me a couple of weeks ago on my YouTube channel. Uh, she said that uh, meditation changed her life, it transformed her life, and even saved her life. And so she started telling her story to me and I was just absolutely blown away by it. And I didn't even hear the whole thing. I said, stop right there. Uh, we got to get this on videotape. And we both agreed that uh, that's why she was kind of reaching out. She kind of needed some help to be able to tell her story. turn it over to you. Why don't you just tell us about yourself, where you're from, your name, and, and get into the story about how meditation affected your life and changed your life. Okay. Um, so my name is Melissa Hartley. I'm 35 years old. I was born in Lenore, North Carolina, and um, I have two sons, ages 14 and 11. I was a stay-at-home mom. That's what I loved doing, was just cooking and taking care of the house and just being with my babies. It was what really brought me happiness and through my world, yeah. And so I was completely like okay with being the homemaker, so to say, while my um, ex-husband worked. When I turned 28, was when things started to suddenly get really bad. Uh, we were on vacation in Florida to Disney World, and uh, we all got up and get ready, and the boys were so excited, like, yeah, we're going to see Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and uh, before we even left, I started getting, like, a severe back pain, and I was like, this is not, <laughs> not normal. And um, by the time we got there, I was having like labor-like pains and feeling like my, like my lumbar spine and my hips were just being crushed is the best way that I could describe it. I had absolutely no idea what was happening to me. And I was trying to describe it to my ex-husband and he was just like, I'm, I don't know. And it was so severe that my body like could not bend. Um, like my stomach would just like, it just descended so huge and I just couldn't even bend and so I couldn't walk. And so they gave me a wheelchair to be able to just kind of enjoy the day with the kids, but I was in so much pain that... Um, that was at Disney World. Yes. You were, you first started with a wheelchair. Yeah. The rest of the trip, I was in the condo where they were, everybody else was out doing things because I couldn't. I was in too much pain. We came back home and I was starting to feel better. It had like 
went away and I was walking again, okay. Um, that this is when I started to have like, especially my left hip was just like in a lot of pain. And so I was having difficulty walking, but I was still walking. And um, so I just kind of tried to push through and then it just started happening over and over again, these flare-ups of just feeling like I was in labor and just being run over and excruciating pain. And so this is when my ex-husband was like, let's go to the doctor. I went through so many labs, like so many blood work that the, the women at LabCorp like, knew me by name. You pushed her enough, she can tell you about 50 stories about 50 different things the doctors went through. I swear, he can consider her a lab rat, you know? Test after test. Do you have epilepsy? Do you have, what's another one? Uh, CPS, do you have uh, Stills disease? Anything you can name on her son, she's probably experienced it. Well, not experienced it, but been through a test to see if you have it. Blood work after blood work after doctor after doctor after we think it's this, to it's not that, it's this. They kept running their test, and then I think it was like eight months of investigation, something like that. Um, almost a whole year before I got a diagnosis, and the diagnosis was adult onset Stills disease, which is a um, rare inflammatory slash autoimmune condition. But, um, yeah, so I had started developing just random fevers and weird body rashes and just so many different symptoms started to just kind of snowball from the original thing. And so I got that diagnosis and they started me off on like extremely high doses of prednisone. And um, I'm sorry to anybody that's ever had to take prednisone because it is awful. Like super bad and then they started me on methotrexate which is like um immunosuppressive injections and i started to see like some progress like relief is like the episodes of the flare-ups seemed to be a little less but um they were still happening and then i uh, started to develop a lot of heart issues of my heart rate was just incredibly high constantly, especially when I would go to stand up if I could stand up and went through several different heart monitors and nuclear stress tests because I couldn't run from hardly being able to walk. So I got the diagnosis of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Now, didn't you tell me over the phone, you said that your heart rate was stayed around 190 beats per minute? It would get up to 190. And just yeah. sitting there on a couch or something. Yes. Wow. Yeah. There was several times where it would just kind of get to 190 and stay. And that's when they started me on like um, a heart medication to keep it under control. But even being on that, I would still end up in the emergency room because we couldn't get it under control. What was your kind of daily conditions? Were you uh, just kind of confined to your bed? Were you in a wheelchair? Were you able to drive around? Or what, what, what was your daily life kind of like at this point in the, your journey? I stopped driving. I didn't drive for years through this. So my day was basically just at home, um, either bedridden or I would, we'd, we had the room set up to where I could like get myself out of the bed into the wheelchair, like if my ex-husband was at work and I would get into the wheelchair and I would just kind of will and go to the living room. And that would be my like, oh, I made it to the living room. Just making it to the living room was like a huge, huge deal. Okay, so I made it back in bed. My pain is so, so intense. I was just wanting to record this to try to spread more awareness of how disabling this illness can be. Um, my husband hadn't left yet for it was time for me to go to the living room with the boys, and so he offered to carry me, but 
I insisted on using my walker because um, he has to carry me a lot. I want to give you just a little look what I'm set up with today. I've got water that is really hard for me to lift and coconut water and then over here I have my bedside potty and my walker just in case I need to get up. This is real. This is my life and some would be too embarrassed to share this and it is embarrassing but when you were bedridden like this what else do I have to hide other than I just want more people to be aware of what Stills disease does to people and what it takes away and the uh, battle that you battle constantly and uh, I know it can vary in different degrees but in my degree I've had it for so long uh, so luckily my husband was getting off earlier today um, not lucky for money but lucky f for me because I can't even take a shower right now because of how bad I feel um, we have a bar installed in there, but I need like a stool or something, but, and then I risk falling off that. It's just a lot. They describe a normal person like a bag of sugar that you can take, whereas someone with a autoimmune disease maybe only has a spoonful of sugar to use. So that's your energy for the day. So just very little can be done. It's just like, it's almost impossible. Like if you push yourself too much, genuinely, you, she'd push herself for sure. Like, she's went from, she went from wheelchair to crutches to, to cane to crutches to wheelchair back and over again, for, back and forth. Like, just, it was, it was horrible, you know. If we did go out when he was off of work, my ex-husband, he would, um, we would take the wheelchair. All right, we're back home now. We had a lot of fun hanging out with uh, Leslie, my best friend, and her boyfriend Mike. And now I'm back in bed on the heating pad, feeling very, very exhausted. And pain's a little high, but not too terrible. Um, so yeah, just wanted to end the vlog here. And I'll see you guys soon. By this point, I had... Um the diagnosis of adult onset Stills disease, the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and then I got diagnosed with dysautonomia, and that's where they had said they thought the the heart rate was coming from, and um, because then I started to experience like severe stomach pain to the point of when I would take one bite of food, I would be in so much pain that I couldn't eat anymore or I would throw it up like I just couldn't. It created way too much pain. And so that's when I was diagnosed with gastroparesis. Is that meaning that you can't digest food? Is that kind of? Yes. So um, gastroparesis is literally your stomach just stops digesting. And so food will just go in and just sit. Mm. And uh, to the point where it'll create a lot of pain until it finally moves along or um, you throw it up. So it's just really awful. And, and uh, they said that that was another form of dysautonomia. Before long, I started to experience like severe burning of my hands and feet. If you ever reach into an oven and you just can immediately feel that on your skin, it was like that, but worse. It was really, really awful. And we noticed that it started, I had like a threshold of like, I had to be at 62 degrees. Anything higher than 62 degrees would trigger it. 
You mean like 62 degrees inside of your house, like with, yes. on the thermostat? Yes. At 62 degrees, I would be in like a kind of normal state in between the burning and the freezing, but still uncomfortable. You can't cover up with blankets. You can't wear socks. It was very, I felt like I am never going to feel like cozy again, you know, and that was just really hard because anything lower than 62, um, a condition called Raynaud's would happen, which is it's essentially the the opposite of erythromyalgia. So in erythromyalgia, your vein, you got vasodilation so fat, like, so far that it creates burning. And then with the Raynaud's, the vasoconstriction kind of blocks off the blood flow. You had to keep the thermostat at 62 degrees. If it was at 63 degrees, you felt like your arms and legs were on fire, basically. And if it was at 61 degrees, then your body would feel like it's freezing. Yes. It was that dramatic of just one degree difference, higher or lower. Yes. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing. I would push myself a lot to stay in the Raynaud's, the freezing more, because it was painful, but it was way more tolerable than the burning. Like when the burning happened, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. That was like, I don't know, just something about it mentally. I just could not do it. Just wore on you a little more than the the cold. Yeah, yeah. which was it was painful too. But yeah, I could just handle it mentally. We started traveling an hour away to um, Winston Salem and started going there, and that's where I had um, a team of doctors there in the rheumatology department. They just continued to increase the methotrexate, and then like I would try to get off the prednisone, and I would taper down, and then things would like hit the fan, and I would be right up on it again. Like, um, it almost sounds like uh, if you were taking the medicine, you were sick. If you were getting off the medicine, yeah, you, you were sick as well too. It just nothing was really working. Yes. Hey guys, I uh, know it's been over a week since I vlogged, but uh, I did manage to avoid the flu. However, um, I don't think they raised my steroids high enough, so I'm back into a flare. It's very, very bad. Um, I do have an appointment with the rheumatologist today, so I will be vlogging that. Um, if you notice my face is turning more round, that's due to the steroids, but whatever makes me feel better. Um, keeping a rash on my face. I don't know if you can see it or not, but I'm also rashy. <sighs> my torso comes and goes. Um, but yeah, check back in. Gotta get ready for the rheumatologist. Fingers crossed it goes good. See you soon. Decided to stop filming before I broke down, but wow, wow, it, this is my reality, and so. <sighs> so tired. In my house, my room w is like right next to hers, or the walls are very thin. We have very thin walls in here, so you basically hear everything in this house. Which my mom bugs me about because of how loud I get sometimes when I'm playing with friends and stuff. But when it comes to that, I could literally hear her screaming in agony sometimes. It's it was not cool. She would she'd scream because like she described it as if her whole body had been ignited. If she had her whole body kind of kind of. Uh, I'm looking for the word. Tensed is what I'm thinking. Kind of a contraction. Her whole body would kind of flare up. I remember her screaming. And it actually got to the point where I will genuinely admit, I I thought I was going to lose her. It's It was a struggle, you know. This is the time period that I started to really, really struggle with the gastroparesis. It had been a problem, but up until this point is when it become like, 
almost the biggest problem, so to say. In the gastroparesis, that was where your body doesn't really digest food right. at all. It either comes up or just goes right through. Yes. So uh, we tried so many different diets. I even tried the autoimmune protocol diet, which is basically like a list of like 15 things you can have. It's very strict. And um, everything we tried, just nothing was helping. And I just kept losing weight. And it got to the point where I got down to 80 pounds, like around 80, 82 pounds. It was so painful to be that tiny too, like just sitting, even if I wasn't in like autoimmune pain, I was just in pain from just sitting on my bones. It was just really awful. Breakfast, now I can't get up from my heart and from how much pain I'm in. I dumped the ground turkey on the floor before I could even get it. Cooked, had to rinse it all. Uh, cut open my finger, trying to cut the vegetables open up. I was slinging stuff out of the pan. I called the pan on fire. Burnt the crap out of my right hand. And I can't even get back to my room or at the table to sit and eat because of how bad my heart's pounding and how bad that hurts. You can get my point where you can kind of genuinely see the, the fear I had I'd lose my mom. Melissa was really good at making me think that she was improving. Always just trying to make me think that she was improving. I think to take the worry off of me. She opened up to me in a text really early and said, you know, Mom, I don't, this is hard to talk about, but I don't think I'm going to make it. I had to have an emergency endoscopy, and which is where they take a camera down your esophagus and look into your stomach. And to see they were just trying to figure out something other answer of why I, I was going through so much pain with eating and having trouble to digest food. I remember going and looking at my doctor and I was just like so disoriented of um, one minute I would be like in the procedure room or they did the procedure and the next thing you know I'd be like the doctors would be in my face and they were saying things like stay with this like I just couldn't hardly even focus I was so it was like I was losing sense of reality of um my body was just almost done I just had so many different emotions of um this isn't fair And um, through this time period, I was trying to just make peace with dying because I knew if I did die, I didn't want to die the way I was feeling, which was just terrified and um, angry and... Um, I didn't want my last moments to feel that way. And so I would just pray to God constantly and I would just beg him, please keep me alive. Um, or at least let me get to a place where I don't feel like this. And so I would just think to myself, I just gotta get through this moment and make it to the next moment. And each moment, with that just being like five minutes past, you made it through that, you can make it through this. I did find myself in this place of just accepting it. And uh, it was, it was just really hard to put it into words, accepting that it was probably the last time you're gonna see your baby's faces. And And this is all I kept thinking about was I have to see my children grow up. I have to see my children grow up. And if it weren't for them, 
I may have just given up. Um, That's when we were like, we need to go somewhere else and see if we can get more answers of what can we do. And that's when um, we went up to the Mayo Clinic. Now you're in Minnesota wind. You choose to keep your face covering on, even in the car, because it's so freaking cold. I thought that, that it was really neat how you go up to the Mayo Clinic and they just like give you a, almost like a football team of <laughs> doctors of all trying to come at it, you know what I mean, and look at it differently. And they came to like very similar diagnosis. They were so uh, educated about gastroparesis that they gave me a lot of tips on how to manage that. It was still in the... Um, severe underweight category. I was to the point they were telling me, you're going to die if you don't gain weight like soon. Like you're not gonna be here anymore or your heart's gonna give out because of how severe the heart issues were with it. And um, when you're just that malnourished, your heart already starts to have to kind of overwork. So it was already like going through. You were already dealing with your heart rate being up at 190 beats per minute yeah. Often, yeah. So at the, they were like, this is not going to be okay. So they got me to the point where it was less scary. And at this point, I started to do a little bit better um, with the autoimmune flare-ups. But uh, I was still just like, every period I got and these labor things, I would say, I think this is going to kill me. And I had said this to the Mayo Clinic too, but they also just just didn't know. Um, and that's when I just like found out that there was an endometriosis specialist in Charlotte, which is one hour away from us, and um, got in contact with her. And within five minutes of her talking to me, she was like, this is endometriosis, like she knew. And uh, she's like, so she scheduled me for a surgery, which was a laparoscopic hysterectomy slash incision surgery. And um, it was like five months out. And so I just had to kind of get through these five months. And um, by the time the surgery happened, it was severe endometriosis. It was the deep infiltrating kind to where like all of my pelvic organs were like being um, glued together and it was just a mess in there and she had to... Sounds like it. She had to remove all of that and then did my hysterectomy. And so the surgery was successful and good. And then I came out of that and... Um, it was such a bizarre feeling because I felt like so validated and like I knew I had these other diseases, but this one was the one that I had been suspicious of like so long ago. And I was like, aha, you know, that's why it's just so important for us to be our own advocates. If even when a doctor is telling you, hey, this is how it is, if you feel like they could be wrong, hold on to that because they're not experiencing it you are and that's where they don't have to go home with that right yeah, yeah. yeah. that's just their nine to five like thinking and this is your life i was still struggling with the dysautonomia just as bad as as first had when it first had its onset and um i just Felt like at this point I had to still advocate for myself where the doctors were saying, well, this is just, it's just going to, it's just going to be this way. So when you got that hysterectomy and got rid of that and the endometriosis, you still, it get, things got better, but you still had all these other issues. Um, like what were the issues that you still left over? You still said you still had the chill blains, the chill and the, the fire in the arms. Oh yes. Yeah. So, um, 
I would get chill blains across my toes, which that is like essentially like frostbite. And that's from the rapid heating and cooling. Like if a normal person, so to say, goes outside in like really freezing degree weather and they come in and they take their socks off or, and they put their feet near a fire and to warm up rapidly, you can get like these things. Is, um, but in my situation, it was because of the erythromalgia and Raynaud's. So I had those sores all over my toes. And um, yeah, I was still dealing with all of that. I was building strength and walking more on my own but I was still struggling because of the heart rate. Like it didn't matter how good my body felt. My heart rate was like, oh no, you're not doing that. And uh, so in between that and the burning, because anytime I would like move too fast, even if the house was still at 62 degrees, if my body temperature started to get up on its own, I was in hell again. So, um, I was miserable and I just kept researching because I just felt like there's got to be something else, like at least some other treatment, something to get this under control to where I'm not in such a severe limitation. Well, you probably sounds like you probably felt like getting rid of your hysterectomy that you kind of had a, a win, a success where you were going in the right direction. You're like, but let's, let's see if we could do this again. You had to get excited a little bit, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly, because I had argued that for years of I thought that's what that was, and then turns out I was right, and so I just had this, I'm not going to give up, because they're just wanting me to just take these medicines and just live this very limited life, and um, so I kept researching, kept researching. It was, like, obsessive. That's all I thought about was... I identified so much with my illnesses and um, just could never find anything new. And my mom, I would talk to her, bless her heart, like constantly, like, look at this, look at this article, look at this. And then she, you know, really wanted to be able to see me not suffer so much. And yeah, so one day she was like, so there's this guy on the show called Rewired. His name's Dr. Joe Dispenza. Dr. Joe Dispenza is a chiropractor, neuroscientist, best-selling author and leader in the space of meditation who is known for his work in the fields of neuroscience, brain function, and the mind-body connection. He gained popularity through his books, workshops, and lectures that focus on helping people discover meditation and use his science to prove the effects meditation can have on the mind and body. And he's claiming that people are healing from cancer and all kinds of conditions. Maybe you should give the show a go, like try it. And um, that's when I found out that it was meditation and what they did. And I was like, <laughs> are, you, are you kidding? <laughs> like, you think me just sitting down and closing my eyes is going to heal me. And she was like, well, <laughs> what else do you got? You know, like, what else are you doing? That's a good point. And I know, right? I was like, you make a really good point. Like, well, I am just sitting here off a lot. What's the difference between just closing my eyes? So, um, so you didn't grow up with meditation or you never, you've heard of it. Uh, your mom heard of it, but y'all weren't really experienced with it at all. No. Yeah. Yeah, no, very different. <laughs> After a few weeks of her kind of nagging me of like, you got to watch this show. Um, I was like, okay, fine. And so I started watching it and it was like just a matter of minutes. And then he started talking about our autonomic nervous systems and how they get out of coherence from our heart and brain. And I was like, oh my God. And him talking about traumatic things that happen to people and just, you know, just life events that we hold on to and staying in the past and like identifying with illnesses. And I was like, oh my God, uh, this is 
this is something. It sounds like you you probably thought uh, that 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 show was written just for you. It's what it felt like. It <laughs> yeah. did. It was another one of those moments where it felt like God was like, "Hey, look, you know, yeah. pay attention." <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, you you got my attention." Yeah. At the end of the episode, he was like, "Well, my name is Dr. Joe Dispenza, and I hope that you join me next on my next episode." And I'm like, "Well, of course." Like, <laughs> I just like, "Why would you even say like?" there's a possibility I won't. <laughs> and so I, I binged watched that show um, like in two days because it's like 13 episodes and it is a lot of information. So it was a lot to kind of take in <laughs> that fast. But um, then I ordered his book, Becoming Supernatural. I love that book so much. It just I connected with it immediately. This is when I was like, I think I'm going to get serious about this. And that's when I started to meditate. In Dr. Joe Dispenza's book, Becoming Supernatural, he has a section called Tuning Into New Potentials. And in that, he he tells you how to write down like what you want to happen. And so on one side of the paper, you put your intention and, and then on the other side, you do elevated emotions of what it would feel like if the intention were to have already happened. And then you go into the meditation and you um, think about the letter. So the doctors had diagnosed me with autoimmune diseases and dysautonomia and had put a lot of labels on me, which I was really identifying with. And the symptoms were completely controlling my life in every aspect and in this list is where you list your intentions of what you do want and so I looked at it as if I was removing those labels the doctors had put on me and said I'm done with that and now this is what I want and so I set those intentions firmly and believed in it so much. When I found out how long his meditations were I was like what? People actually sit there for an hour? (laughs) I was just like, I can't, I can't believe that. And so I was like, 20 minutes seems a little bit better to start off with. And I felt like that was a long time. Like after doing my first one, I was like, I meditated for 20 minutes. Like, go me. (laughs) I felt like that's a huge accomplishment to just sit there. And, and at this stage, it was very just Learning how to just sit and be still. Honestly, it, like those first experiences of um, connecting to the meditation on such a like a simple level started to change me completely already because um, I had always felt my entire life just very anxious, like I had said, and this was like the first time in my entire life I felt like I could just be. And I just felt safe and just okay. And um, so that was what it started off like, just just feeling peace, you know, learning how to um, just quieten down the mind and just be okay. And um, I was like, well, I love that. <laughs> and uh, It probably felt good to feel something different. Yes. I wish I would have known this sooner because <laughs> I just felt like, Just with that simple level of meditation was a huge impact on on me really mentally. And um, so I was like, well, I wanna do this just for that. And then that's when um, I started to get even more excited about it and- Now, were you kind of thinking that like you do these meditations and uh, you know, were you going in thinking that you were gonna heal yourself from this? Was that an idea or was it just like, well, I feel better, I'm just gonna entertain myself with meditation? I was definitely focused on healing, like 100%. So I did that part and then breaking the habit of being yourself, I got that book and started doing the writing work with it. And it was very, goal orientated to not being chronically ill anymore and um then when i went to his website i was looking through his meditations and i was reading like all of the details so every one of them and i found blessings of the energy center number five and it said that at the end there's a laying down part and that's the part where your autonomic nervous system resets 
And I was like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> if one of them's gonna do it, it probably would be that one. You know, I thought that was a good place to start on like the longer one. And um, so I started doing that. I would basically just wake up, sit up, put on a blindfold and well, like mask and then headphones and go for it. This is when I started to have really profound and crazy, like just, I had no idea that meditation could be like this experiences. What kind of changes did you see in Melissa the more she meditated? Well, she started to get stronger and she started to get better and she started to get her, um, I believe one of the first things was the erythromyalgia. Um, to get that under control, and that was that's a really big deal. Trying to get that um, calm down. I can move around the house more without my hands and feet start burning. So I thought, hmm, well maybe if I just like adjust the temperature a degree and see what happens. And so I worked it to sixty three, and I was okay. I thought okay. And uh, so I bumped it to 64, you know, and no, oh, it started happening. And I'm like, okay, well, there's a degree. And it was like a huge win. And um, throughout that summer, I just slowly started to increase the temperature because when I would like take a shower, I would notice I would be able to get it a little warmer because I could only do showers that were like, lukewarm um, to kind of keep my body in that in-between state of not uh, burning and not freezing. And so I started to be able to adjust it a little bit more and more. I went from having to keep the thermostat on 62 degrees in the house to slowly increasing it a degree by degree to where I got to the point that the house was 72 degrees. And this is when my sons were like, okay, can you not make it any warmer? And I just found it really funny uh, <laughs> that they were complaining now and I was the one okay. And um, I realized, okay, well, I'll stop there. And the past four years, I had to live in my house at 62 degrees. And this was the first time that I was able to increase the temperature without seeing a physical reaction of pain. And I, um, no question knew it was the meditation and just became so thankful. There was a real drastic change. Uh, it was very, uh, I mean, to be fair, the drastic change could be combated and thrown around, but Yet there was still a steady increase in her mood and how she felt. Like, like it, it's not like she changed overnight, but the 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 changes, the even the small changes, could be seen as drastic from the state she'd been in for what three plus years. I would get out of a meditation and just feel like so good and like oh god, just like I don't know how I could be sick anymore, you know. And there was just this one in particular um, meditation that. At, um, at some point, my whole body started moving and shaking, and I was, like, crying and laughing. And, uh, <laughs> you know, from, like, if anybody had just walked in the room, they'd have been like, what <laughs> is going on? But, you know, I wasn't even in my body in, anymore in that experience. I was, like, in a very heavily meditative state. So I started to notice that my heart rate wasn't climbing as high. It was, you know, typically before meditation, it would get to be going like 160 uh, beats per minute. It was going like an average of what it should be around like 90 beats per minute. The more I meditated, I started to realize that I was having more of a threshold of I could get up and do things more, without it getting so high. And I knew it wasn't the medicine I was on because the medicine never really helped that much anyway. It had to be the meditation. So I went to my cardiologist and explained to him what um, I had been doing. And 
he at first was just in shock and he was hesitant to um, work me off of the medication. But I told him, like, I am seeing more um, progress and being able to keep my heart stabilized this way than I had ever seen with the medication. So what was the point to continue? And uh, he was, you know, nervous because I had been hospitalized many times um, where they had to give me lots of medications and fluids and things to get my heart to stabilize to um, an okay level. It never really ever stabilized, but to where it wasn't as big of a threat um, that I would die, basically. So we started to taper off the medication and was having no issues. I would go back and talk to the cardiologist and he would see, he would like stand me up and he would be monitoring my heart rate and to um, see, is it really being stabilized? Because after years of it not being, he was just very nervous to believe that with no medication that I was able to keep my heart stabilized so after a few months we slowly just worked off the medication and this was a huge huge win for me and for my family it's just incredible Uh (laughs) so what you're telling me is that that you um had all these diseases autoimmune diseases you had these sores on your body you uh, had these freezing temperatures in your body, sensations and burning sensations. You couldn't walk. You're in a wheelchair. Your heart rate was 190 beats per minute every so often. And it wasn't any medication you took. You just started meditating. And all those symptoms and all the medication are done. Yeah. She feels like a completely different person. She she giggles all the time. She's happy. It's kind of, if you compare a picture of her now and a picture of her then, it's, it's like looking at two different people. How, how long of a process from when you started meditating till you noticed, wow, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is all gone? How long, how long of a process was it from when uh, you started meditating to where you didn't see any more symptoms and realized, I'm free? Um, I'd say around six months, somewhere around there, six to seven. I'm going to be honest. I'm typically seen as one of the more wise people for my age, quote unquote, but I really get a lot of it from her. She's, she's, she's very helpful. She has, she, she's been through it all. She is a, she has what I would describe as a main character that acts to it. And I, I genuinely believe she has a purpose on this earth. I mean... She may not have been gifted with super strength or super speed or anything, but she's a she's a real superhero. You know her her strength is getting back up. She's she's been through a lot, like in every stage of her life. From she's always just had trouble, and it never seems to go her way. But you know she's here, and she can still manage to giggle every every minute. It's not hard to make her laugh, which is kind of impressive to see what she's been through. Yeah. So you're off every medication. You don't have one symptom, and uh, you look great. You don't have any sores on your body. You walked in here. You uh, How long has it been since you've been symptom-free from all of your issues? Um, so we're in October now. I said one year. One year? Yes. It's, it's got to feel good. Yes. I'm sure. Your life's got to look totally different now, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's hard to put into words <laughs> how thankful I am. I'm going to be honest. It it just didn't really hit me till like, later, like, in the process. I genuinely, it, it felt like, you know, she had just been in that bed and you know for a while i i just hadn't registered to me that slowly but surely i was getting my mom back and it was just a moment where it was like i was talking to her it was like you know i haven't really felt like 
I have had a mom recently, and she just kind of hugged me, you know? And it's, it's been a while since I could say that I have a mom. Funny enough, I wouldn't change one single step through my journey from the beginning till now, like, not one thing. Even as hard as it was. Yes. Yeah. Because I wouldn't be who I am now, and um, the person that I am now, I'm just genuinely happy and I feel like very authentic to myself, whereas in the past I was always running and just terrified and just constantly living in a state of fear. And then being that sick and going through that much pain, any little thing that arises in just everyday life now, which I'll see other people like losing losing it and getting angry and getting frustrated and i'm just like wow <laughs> um it completely just changed uh, my perspective on what's worth getting upset about you know what i mean and um yeah so right. it sounds like uh meditation works for you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's exciting that's an incredible story and I still meditate daily. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of course. I don't see how you could. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest. I, don't, I still don't really understand it now. I can, I can, I'm a very logically minded person. I've never been very spiritually wise such as she is. But even now I can, I can understand that it wasn't the medicine and it wasn't the tons of medications and it wasn't the immense amount of therapy and the best doctors that we can find and whatever it was her it was whether you believe in meditation or not you have to agree that the one thing that saved her from dying was her she saved herself no one else did that whether you believe in spirituality or meditation i believe genuinely that a person can change anything they wanted if they tried hard enough we may not be th- the smartest sometimes we may not be the smartest in the grand scene of things but the one thing that we have is the ability to adapt and grow and change our futures it sounds like maybe you learned that through experiencing what your mom went through yeah you were able to see that and you learned that yourself mm-hmm. you saw it firsthand i did Life doesn't really come easy for some people. In others, it just seems to always work out. Some people overcome their struggles, and some people wreck their lives because of the things that have happened to them in their past. It's true, life isn't fair, but it's how you face it that matters. Even when it doesn't seem like it, you have to realize it will get better as long as you don't give up.